We're starting a new series of messages this morning uh, called uh, Good Question. And uh, this, this particular series was spurred by uh, a series of things that happened in the Christian world, over, well, really almost since the first of the year, and uh, disturbing things. Some prominent uh, people in uh, positions of some kind of Christian leadership, ministry, decided just to walk away from it. Uh, they decided that uh, they didn't believe God anymore, didn't believe the Bible anymore, and they just stepped away. And there's a word for that decision. It's called apostasy. And it just means uh, I'm rejecting this faith. Now, most people don't publicly declare it like several of these people have this year uh, in prominent places. They it's more like uh, when you have a restaurant and you don't like it, you usually don't go talk to the manager. You just don't go back. Well, most people, that's how they do their apostasy. And there are a lot of people who are apostate today. There was a time when they served, a time when they said they believed, a time when uh, the things of God seemed to be prominent in their lives. And then they had some form of religion, but they didn't have a relationship to Christ. And they just walk away. One of those who uh, was a part of this group of people, and this is what brought, uh, brought us to address some of these things in our short series called Good Question. It's Marty Sampson, and I share his name because he shared his name publicly in his renunciation of his faith. And he's a prolific uh, worship music writer. Prominent in uh, Hillsong. Many of you are familiar with the songs that come out of Hillsong, great worship material. He was a strong writer for uh, that ministry. And he revealed he was losing his faith, and he said he believed Christianity was just another of many religions. And he wrote in the Instagram post, he said, uh, it's time for some real talk. I'm genuinely losing my faith, and it doesn't bother me. Like, what bothers me now is nothing. I'm so happy now, so at peace with the world. It's, it's crazy. He continues on. This is a soapbox moment, so here I go. Now, I won't read everything that he, he said, but I want to address these things. He wrote, why is the Bible full of contradictions? Nobody talks about it. How can God be love and yet send four billion people to a place all because they don't believe? No one talks about it. And he went through a series of no one talks about it. This is the part that, that got me. There are volumes written and thousands of people talking about everything that was on his list. And I'm thinking, how is it? How is it that someone could pretend to love God, worship God, serve God, and never be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If he had done a slight bit of discipleship, a slight bit of leaning into what the Bible says, instead of just singing songs about God, he, he might have had a lot different story at the end of the day. It's a tragic, tragic story of foolishness. And the world is full of it. Uh, we call what we're going to talk about in these weeks apologetics. Apologetics is not apologizing. Apologetics is defending the faith. And there are great resources available. And uh, some of you, uh, people periodically will email or call and say, Hey, Chad, can you give me something to help me out here? And, uh, well, it, at the, on the front page of our church website, at the bottom of the page, there's things that says Pastor's Blog. If you go to... Our staff page on um, my spot, there's a link to the pastor's blog. And the first thing up, uh, I put it up last night so it would be a readily available, a list of my favorite apologetic sites. And there's a whole set of them there. And I want you, 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 you need to save them, keep that somewhere so that when the questions arise, when you need some resources on defending the faith, uh, you've got some ready resources, so please uh, take advantage of those opportunities. One of the saddest parts for me about this 
is anytime there's, and there's a lot of articles written about what he posted on Instagram. Uh, then there are comments about, about that in the other places where the story shows up. And there were a host of people who in commenting about what this guy said, responded, this is so sad. And I guess he's right. He's a Christian celebrity. It must be true. And I suppose that they'll follow down the same path of destruction because they had no foundation in the Word of God either. This is what I want you to know today. Your faith is not a blind faith. Don't ever let anybody tell you that. Because you're talking to someone who has never explored it when they say your faith is a blind faith. We have a wealth of support for our biblical beliefs and our biblical worldview. And over the next Sundays, we're going to address some of the big questions. And I want to give you just a firmer sense of the foundations for your faith. Now, this may be a conversation you have with someone else, and it may be just so that you can clear up some doubts that are lingering in your own heart, and you can just know that what you believe is true. It's a matter of the, uh, it's a heart matter. And at the middle of the foundations for your faith is the question that we begin with. We've been talking, through, working our way through the Old Testament the last uh, several weeks. We talk a lot about the Bible because we're a Bible-focused church. And here's the question today, can I trust the Bible? I mean, it's our source book for life, for faith, for who God is and how God does things. The, uh, the issues of the authority of the Bible, the trustworthiness of the Bible, it's really a foundational thing in my own spiritual journey. But I had a very childlike faith. I trusted God's Word. I read God's Word, and I got to college and came up against a, a devout and aggressive atheist professor who knocked all the props out from under me. And I began to wonder, is this just foolishness? Is there a foundation for my faith? Do I have a rock to stand on here? But unlike, uh, unlike the music guy who just walked away, I went looking, and I found a uh, strong foundation, solid rock foundation for what I believed and why I believed it in the apologetics world. And I'm grateful for those folks who dedicate their lives to that effort, to explaining it, to defending it, and to helping the rest of us know what we believe is true and what we believe is not just a a made up bunch of foolishness. Now, you go on that journey, you never know where it'll lead. For me, it led uh, to my calling to ministry. Uh, maybe do the same thing for you. You never know what God's up to in uh, the challenges that you face. I want to read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Just as one of the, and I, I've listed several in your program, but this, uh, just one of the foundational statements about the Word of God. There, the Apostle Paul writes to young Timothy and says, all Scripture is inspired by God. It is God-breathed. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, I've given you the questions that we're asking and some of the key things that we'll talk about today in your program and I'm going to start out with a question that was asked, because I, you hear this, you'll run into this. The Bible's just full of contradictions. Now, a lot of things people say, they throw it out there with no explanation, with no support for their argument. They just throw it, and people, people bite it like a fish biting a hook, and uh, don't think maybe they don't know what they're talking about. This is one of those times. Is the Bible full of contradictions? Now, if you read your Bible, you, some of you, I mean, you've talked to me about these things. Some of these things are things I've given you answers to when you've asked. Um, and we deal with them as we go through the Bible. Because sometimes it seems, well, this gospel says it this way, and this gospel says it this way, and it seems like there's a contradiction going on there. Like those two guys aren't agreeing. So does that mean the Bible isn't true? And just a little bit of investigation will show that's not at all the case. Now, we shouldn't minimize the question. Always, the Bible is not afraid of uh, questions. The Bible is up to rigorous uh, exploration. But we don't need to exaggerate it either. 
we find uh, people want to employ a different set of rules when it comes to the Bible than to everything else that they do in life in order to try to discredit it. And that's a problem. What constitutes, this is the hard part of this message, by the way, and I know, man, apologetics, you're going to have to actually think as a Christian, and I recognize that that's difficult. But we're going to have to be a better thinking people as we go forward because challenges are going to come bigger and more aggressively to, our, to us. So we're going to have to be a people who dig into this thing. Here we go. What's a contradiction? Well, in logic, uh, and the foundation for logical thinking is the law of non-contradiction. And uh, the, it's the idea that a thing cannot be A and non-A at the same time. So here you go. I, I can say, well, it is, it is not raining on me right now at this spot. It is raining on me right now at this spot. Well, those two things can, cannot be, that there is a contradiction in what we have just said. If you can't demonstrate a violation of this principle in Scripture, then, then uh, you can, if you if you show that's happening in Scripture, then you have a contradiction. For example, if the Bible said, and the Bible does not say this, just in case you're not a good Bible reader either, so we're trying to get into God's Word. The more you read God's Word, the more you discover the truth of God's Word, and the more you understand God's Word. If the Bible said in Matthew, Jesus died on a cross on a hill outside Jerusalem, and Mark said, Jesus died on a hill outside Nazareth, we have ourselves a contradiction. Those two things cannot be uh, meshed together. It's a provable error. So when facing possible contradictions, and we'll give some biblical examples in a moment, it's of the highest importance to remember two statements may differ from each other without being contradictions from each other. Because sometimes there, there's... There's a distinction between a contradiction and a difference. Explain it this way. If I say, if I say to, to Jennifer here, I love oatmeal. I say to David here, I hate oatmeal. Well, if I say that on the same Sunday morning to a couple of people and they compare notes, we have ourselves a problem. Because we have a contradiction going on, right? Contradiction. We have a problem here. Now, if I told Jeff 40 years ago when we were in high school together, I hate oatmeal. And I tell Bill this morning, he said, how do you feel about oatmeal? Because these are kind of deep discussions I have with my friends. How do you feel about oatmeal? And I said, I love oatmeal. That's not a contradiction because my opinion has just changed over years. In reality, that's not true. That's just an illustration. I still hate oatmeal. <laughs> but you see, you see the difference, the, the non-contradiction in the, in the illustration. Here's another one. If I tell you I hate oatmeal and you run into my son Austin this afternoon and you say, hey, how does your dad feel about oatmeal? He says, as far as I know, he loves oatmeal. Well, that's a difference of opinion. It's not a contradiction, uh, uh, one or the other. The Bible works more like the second two examples in the things that seem to be contradictions, not like the first. And we create problems with ourselves when we assume the first example is relevant. It is. Here's a biblical example. And there, there's several of these kind of things, and this is what people get all worked up about. Jesus uh, encountered uh, some blind men in Jericho. Matthew relates there were two blind men who met Jesus. Mark and Luke only mention him meeting one blind man in Jericho. Well, do, do those statements contradict each other? Does one deny the other? Well, actually, their perspectives and they're complementary. Here's how this goes. Let's say uh, I go to a city council meeting in our fair city of Allen. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking to folks. And uh, 
after the meeting is over. And somebody asked me the next day, so who'd you talk to? I said, well, I talked to, talked to the mayor, talked to the chief of police. Oh, that's great. A little while later, I, I see another one of my friends. He said, hey, were you at the city council meeting? I said, I was. Uh, I had a really interesting conversation with the mayor. Have I contradicted myself? Have I said things that cannot be gelled together? And did I lie to someone? No. Now, if I'd said, I only talked to the mayor, that'd be a different story. It's not a contradiction. It's just a difference, a different focus to the conversation, a different part of the story. The biblical statements that fall into this category, they get accused of being contradictions. That's how they, they fall. Critics think they find errors in the passages when, in fact, uh, they just haven't read them. Some difficulties in Scripture result from inadequate knowledge of circumstances. They don't involve an error. They just prove that there's something about the background, something about the culture, something about the original languages, something about the context that I don't understand. And what happens is that historical and archaeological, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, as those things proceed, there's new light to be shed on difficult portions of Scripture. But there are things in the Bible that, when we'll hit archaeology in a moment, but for years people said, the, the Bible's not true. And then archaeology proved it, it was true. Well, we, we've been digging around forever and ever. We found everything there is. Did you notice the news last, last week? On the 22nd of October, National Geographic released a finding that they were working on a construction project not far from the, the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. And as they were digging under to do some work uh, underground, they came across an old road. And all the evidence clearly points to it being a road that was... Uh, that was constructed under the supervision and leadership of Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea in the first century. That was last week they revealed that. They're, they're turning over rocks every day somewhere in the lands of the Bible, discovering new things and that add new insight, new color, new uh, truth. And it always has backed up the Bible. Sometimes we just haven't gotten that next step yet in these things that would be called contradictions. Now, I want to get that one out of the way because it was the first thing that uh, our example from the introduction uh, he touched on. But this is the core of this story. Second thing, weren't there other authentic sources or gospels that were discarded as the Bible was assembled in AD, 1, AD 325? This is how it's always phrased. Uh, it seems like it always points back to 325. And uh, there's a reason that they point back to 325. And you hear these, these uh, conversations regularly. The challenge is coming up often. The reason they choose uh, 325 is because that's when the Council of Nicaea took place and under the Emperor Constantine. And there is this big conspiracy theory because in America, we love conspiracy theories. We love that somehow we've been tricked and lied to and that there's a secret something going on somewhere, and, and uh, there are a lot of TV shows made about it. So the idea is that at the Council of Nicaea, Constantine and the gang, they got together and said, we're throwing out these stories about Jesus because they don't fit with what we want to do politically. Uh, if you want to catch any of those conspiracy theories, the great place to find them is the History Channel. How many of you get the History Channel? There are all kinds of fascinating things on the History Channel. You got your uh, Pawn Stars. You got your Swamp People. You got your Ancient Aliens and your Bigfoot Captured uh, shows. So there's some high-level scientific uh, historical uh, information that are coming out of the History Channel. The History Channel every year is going to do... They're going to always do it around Easter. They'll usually do something around Christmas about why the Bible got twisted up and secret books that should have been in the Bible aren't in the Bible. And they bring forward these scholars 
And I think they find them at gas stations just hanging around because they don't have the credentials to talk about anything with biblical authority or uh, biblical history, historical authority. But they push forward the idea. And what they say is that some book got left out and that they think it should have been included. Uh, I've asked this question before as we've talked about this particular thing. I'm giving you some different examples that I've used in the past because we've talked about these things before. But, uh, how many of you have attended First Baptist Church Allen for at least five years? Okay. Then why don't you, if you've been here for at least five years, turn to the people next to you, explain how we got the four Gospels. And I'll come back in ten minutes after you finish that explanation. Well, it'd be good to be able to know how to do that. But I'm going to help you out today a little bit with a refresher course. Here's how we got the Gospels. Jesus traveled from place to place, and he performed miracles, and he taught the people, and uh, he changed lives, and he still does. Initially, Jesus' life and teachings, they're just in the middle of this. He ascends back into heaven, and they're just telling these stories, and they're they're, they're teaching other people about him, and they're inviting other people to relationship to him. And they're, they're just rolling. It is coming fast and furious. But it's not written down yet because they're in the middle of disciple-making. But it's remembered and retold by a culture. And we still have cultures like this today. Our American culture is not this, but it's, it was an oral history culture. They remembered the details. They rehearsed the details. They protected the details of oral history. We believe from uh, different sources that the literacy rate in Israel around the first century was probably in the single digits. So not a lot of readers, but they valued oral history and they told the stories and told the stories. But here's what happens. After a few years, the eyewitnesses to the events of what Jesus did, what Jesus said, they're starting to die off. Uh, they're getting older. And by this time, the church is expanding rapidly. And what we're getting is we're getting a lot of false teachers who are just jumping on the bandwagon, adding a more interesting... By the way, we still have a lot of false teachers who jump on the bandwagon, add a little of their own material to what sounds like biblical material, yet it is a terrible distortion of what Jesus teaches. Church leaders started recognizing, we need to write this down, Jesus' life and teachings. Because if we don't, it's going to get really messed up. And it's going to get uh, stolen away from us by the false teachers. So we need something that's going to outlive us, something that is going to be dependable, that we can spread to the churches, spread to the world. And that's how and why the Gospels end up getting written down. Over time... Other documents about Jesus get written in the centuries that follow. People talked about him, and this is what you'd expect. Some of them are called the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels, we're already seeing, seeing evidences of Gnosticism, which is, it's more of a philosophy than a religion, but it took on a lot of religious uh, significance in the first century. Toward the end of the first century, and then we see it in full bloom, second, third centuries, there were some Gnostic Gospels that emerge. And uh, the Gospel of Judas was uh, published, oddly enough, just in the last few years, but it had been around for uh, years and years and years. Gnosticism, uh, say more of a form of thought than a form of religion, and it, it emphasized lots of secrets and concealed information. And like you were on the, you were an insider if you know the secret information. There are still religious books being written like this all the time. And people get sucked into them. There's a secret little code that we have uncoded. And it's over here and it, it's going to reveal some often a prophetic uh, truth or something like that. But it's a secret thing. And you've got to know all the secrets and how to unlock the secrets. But it's not biblical. And it's a modern form of Gnosticism. We still deal with it today because it's very intriguing. It pulls people in and it makes money. Well, the Gnostic Gospels, and there's a whole set of them, talk about Jesus. And I'm telling you, having read several of these, a dozen or so, you, you read it, and you say, well, that sounds kind of like what Matthew said. Well, that sounds a lot like what John said. And then you hit something, you say, well, that's crazy talk. 
that's, that's so out of bounds. It doesn't sound right at all. The early church leaders realized they needed to have a criteria to help them decide which documents were gospels, which were faithful, inspired by the Holy Spirit, trustworthy. And those things became known as the canon. That's a good word for you to know, canon. And canon is just a, a word that comes from a Greek word that means the norm, the standard, the rule. And they wanted to know which books ought to be canonical, which books are the trustworthy books that truly tell the story of Jesus, which ones are reliable. So they, they, they went through a careful process of this. And I've noted to you, the first thing, does the document have roots connected to one of the apostles? Was it written by an apostle or a student, uh, an associate of one of the apostles? So you look, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels that we have in our Bible, and they meet this requirement. Matthew was Matthew, one of the disciples. Mark was a student of Peter, one of the disciples. Luke is a friend of the apostle Paul, an associate with a variety of the early apostles. John, uh, the disciple John, walked with Jesus. And by the way, the other books in your New Testament, they, they meet the same criteria. They are written by those who were there, those who were eyewitnesses, those who very close to the apostles and those who knew the apostles. So what we find is that what's, what's in your New Testament? That starts with Matthew, it ends with the Revelation. All those books were written before the end of the first century. And that means in the, the Gospels, within 30 to, uh, if we really pushed it out for John's Gospel, 60 years after Jesus died. So here's the key to that. In other words, they were written during a time when there were still eyewitnesses to the events. That's the big deal. They were written early when there were still people around who had seen it, who had seen what Jesus did, who had witnessed the miracles, uh, who, who could verify the story. And so, if something shows up that's not the way it happened, there's still people around to say, that's not true. That has been distorted. You are making stuff up. And they would challenge it because the eyewitness is still there. The critics uh, saying there are all these other books, they think the church, early church, was trying to cover things up. And in reality, the books that are the Gnostic Gospels, they were all written much later, uh, well after any witnesses were dead. And they're often given fictitious, uh, misleading names. There's a Gospel of Mary. There's a Gospel of Peter. Even though they were written over a century or more, sometimes two centuries after Peter and Mary had already died. And so this is the uh, first thing in how we got what we have. Second thing, to be included in the canon, the contents of a book had to be consistent. And we're just talking specifically about the Gospels just to keep our our discussion tight the contents of the book had to be consistent with the kind of teaching Jesus did so here's another account of Jesus life it is very old uh, this is one that uh, several people and still argue and it'll come up on those TV shows on the history channel uh, in between wrestling gators and uh, selling junk in Las Vegas have uh, argued the gospel of Thomas should have been in, in the scriptures. And the Gospel of Thomas is it's the, around the middle of the second century, so the witnesses are all dead. It's coming in late, but it's earlier than some of the Gnostic Gospels. And they say it ought to be taken more seriously. Okay, so why is it not taken more seriously? Well, there are a few reasons. I want to share a couple of things. One of the things that shows up in here, it tells a story, the Gospel of Thomas, about Jesus when he was a boy. Now, remember, we have that Jesus is born, and he's circumcised when he goes to the temple. And then we see Jesus the next time he's 12 years old. Well, Gospel, Gospel of Thomas, they were curious about what happened in that in between uh, birth and 12. And so they have this story about little boy Jesus was out playing in the mud out in the yard with the other kids. And he put together a clay pigeon, clapped his hands, and it came to life and flew off. 
Okay, is there anything in the rest of what you've seen about Jesus in the Gospels that would lead, lead you to believe Jesus does uh, parlor tricks for fun? No, there is not. Always with purpose, always, uh, always for God's glory, not just doing magic tricks on the side. And so that doesn't make sense. But this is the big one uh, that is so inconsistent. It's at the end of the Gospel of Thomas. So again, you got all the players, and some of the language sounds close until you start, wow. Simon Peter said, this is from the Gospel of Thomas, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. He's a hater. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself a male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Aren't you glad that didn't make it into the Bible? The weirdness of that, that's what you're going to run into consistently in the Gnostic Gospels. Those kind of aberrations. Third thing. In order for a book to be included in the canon of Scripture, it had to have widespread influence. And what that means is the churches in Israel, the churches in Asia Minor, the church in Rome, wherever Christians were gathering... It had to have acceptance because there's, there, there's a tendency to kind of be a homer and say, well, you know, it's kind of crazy, but that came from my hometown, so we ought to get that one in the Bible. And it had to have widespread acceptance that it had to be seen as the Word of God in a variety of cultures and a variety of places. Well, it took some time and discussion in some cases, but the Gospels and the other books that are included in the New Testament are the ones that fit these standards, and truth is none of the alternatives even comes close. The idea that we have these New Testament Gospels today because Constantine put them together in 325 uh, for political purposes is just way off base. The reality is in 325, they were arguing about some significant theological things about the nature of Christ primarily at, at Nicaea. But they didn't have any big debate in relationship to what is Bible, what is God's truth in God's Word. Because that was already settled. There's a guy uh, a little over 100 years before Constantine named Origen, one of the early church fathers. And in his writings, he says, the four Gospels. And then he goes on to name them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he makes the statement, are the only undisputed ones in the whole church of God throughout the whole world. That's a pretty big one. That's a, at least a century before Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. William Barclay, New Testament professor, once wrote, it is the simple truth to say that the New Testament books became canonical because no one could stop them from doing so. They have power to them. Third thing, hasn't archaeology disproven the Bible? And uh, folks will make a statement, oh, archaeology has disproven the Bible. Like science has disproven the Bible. And we spent a Sunday uh, a couple of years ago dealing with that crazy question and how it gets blown all to pieces with just the slightest effort you look at archaeology and what the archaeology what archaeology does it proves again and again that the places and the people all the all the bible talks about and the places where they walked are not fiction because you can still go to those places today we're digging up stuff all the time there are archaeologists working all over from from uh the greek world the jewish world and everything in between. They're, they're finding things constantly. So when the Bible talks about the Areopagus, Mars Hill in Athens, where Paul goes up against the scholars, I've stood on Mars Hill. And then there's a riot in the theater in Athens, and well, I've, I've stood at that theater. And it talks about Capernaum. I've walked the streets of Capernaum. All these things are demonstrated, proven. You can go there and you can visit them today. The book of Acts is a lot of historical references. Luke is a real detailed guy. And, uh, well, you've got to appreciate Luke. Here's, here's what, in, in, in Acts, he talks about 54 cities, 39 different countries, and 9 different islands in the Mediterranean and Aegean Sea. With perfect historical accuracy every detail of it, from where the shipping lanes were to every detail of it, perfect. 
Today, no one could dispute it. One of the great things about how archaeology works with the Bible is that again and again, the Bible is more accurate than a lot of our ideas about history. Because see, until they dig stuff up, sometimes they say, well, there's never such a thing. You know, one of my favorites, because I've stood right next to the pilot stone, they said, for years, there's no such person as Pontius Pilate. There's no record of him in history. He never existed. And then at Caesarea Maritime, Caesarea by the sea, they dug up the pilot stone. You can go and you can stand next to it like I did at the museum museum in, in Jerusalem. And it says, Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea, all the details that fit exactly with the biblical record. But they didn't find it until 1961. But then, there's no dispute anymore. Sometimes you just wait for the next shovel to turn over some dirt and discover again what you thought you could doubt. Here's another one. For a long time, historians disputed this. They said, this whole thing about Solomon and he had all these horses... They weren't doing anything with uh, cavalry in 1,000 B.C. uh, in that part of the world. They would have had uh, camels maybe, but not in those numbers, and not a bunch of horses and chariots. That wasn't how they did things back then. And then they started digging around Megiddo, which is one of the chariot cities listed. Remember when we read 1st and 2nd? We read 1st and 2nd Kings as a part of our Old Testament study. We talked about those a couple weeks ago. Well, they found in Megiddo a bunch of horse stalls to the tune of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And then they found more of them in the other ancient cities that are listed in the Bible as the chariot cities where Solomon housed his horses and his chariots during those times. You always wish that you'd get an apology letter from the the disputers. They never get around to that. They're still looking for the next thing to dispute. But the Bible has always proved it right. It's never been proved wrong by archaeology. One of my favorite examples is an empire called the Hittite Empire. Now, the Hittite Empire is mentioned 50 times in the Bible. Old Testament. 50 times. So that's that's a lot of press. But they said it did not exist for a very long time. There was no evidence of it. We can't find it. It's talking about this like it was a world power, and we have no evidence of the Hittite Empire. Then they started following a trail in the late 1800s, and then in the early 1900s, a professor by the name of Hugo Winkler discovered Bogoskoy, and he found 10,000 clay tablets, which was the library in the capital of the Hittite Empire. What they discovered is exactly what the Bible says. It covered what is, uh, we talk about Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. The Hittite Empire covered that whole territory. It was an enormous world power for a long time. And now, the people who are doubters, oh, there's no such thing as a Hittite Empire now. They all say there's a Hittite Empire. And if you're watching your favorite game today, why don't you take a little break at halftime and Wikipedia can tell you all about the Hittite Empire today because of archaeology. The reason it matters, all this matters, is our faith, the Christian faith, is rooted in history. And this is what makes the Christian faith different from the rest. Is the rest, it's just a philosophical construct. It's, it's a lot of religious platitudes. But see, in the Bible, it's rooted in time and place and people, and it's verifiable. If you pull it back and it's just about an idea, it's not tied to anything that's verifiable. It's just an idea. But our God is a God who works in lives and in history, and these things matter when God does things like that because he has shown not just uh, great teaching about how to live life but he's shown evidence his word is true and if it's true about all those other things we can trust it to be true about who God is things 
We believe the Christian faith is not just a pretty story that can add some nice metaphorical understanding to life, but that God is actually rooted in history. The Apostle John said it this way in 1 John. This is toward the end of his life, and he wanted to be sure this message was clear. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we've observed and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. John, in essence, he just says, this stuff really happened. This is not myth. This is not legend. It's not just a pretty story. I was there. I saw him. I touched him. I heard him with my own ears. I knew him, and I'm willing to die, rot in prison, to be found faithful to him because it's all real. So you check it out. If you have a doubt, you check it out. Lean into it. Don't, don't just take what somebody who just wanted to throw a criticism and see if it would stick to the wall. Don't, don't, don't believe it just because. Don't believe it just because I said it. You go look, investigate, study. But don't you say that all faiths are just fabrications and everybody understands they're all just the same thing. They don't relate to anything that actually happened. Because that is not so. As John says, I was there. I saw it, I touched it, I heard it, I followed him. And he changed my life and he can change your life too. And I'll tell you, that's one more way you can know the authority of the Bible. Read the Bible. Read these gospel stories that tell the story of Jesus. Read the stories of Jesus. Ask God to speak to you through the stories. Listen to the stories. Because his story, Jesus' story, gives life. This story changed my life. He continues to work in my life and change my life, transform me, move in me, guide me, direct me. It's personal for me, not just words on a page. I want you to sit down with these guys. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just jump in there. Maybe you've walked with God for a long time, and maybe you're just searching, seeking today. Just open up those books and read. Don't get bogged down the cultural stuff or trying to pronounce a name that's a hard name to pronounce. Just read a few chapters and ask Jesus to show himself to you in a new way. And what has happened to millions of peoples in hundreds of cultures over thousands of years can happen to you. You can know God because he has made himself 